Welcome to another basketball recruiting podcast here on TarHillIllustrated.com, Zoom edition. This is THI publisher Andrew Jones, and joining me, as he always does, our very own Clint Jackson sporting a Wisconsin hat. <laughs> Actually, it's a Washington, I was going to say Senators, that's how far back I go. Washington Nationals hat. Clint said he was going to wear his hat, so he dared me to wear my Orioles hat. And not only am I wearing that, but look here, folks. I'm all decked out in Orioles glory which is something that people don't generally say very often these days. There is no glory in Camden Yards, Clint. I cannot imagine how cheap that hat and, and shirt are. Not only one, because we're during the quarantine and we're seeing prices drop, but because it's an Orioles uh, hat and, and t-shirt. So, If you'll know, I got this hat back when they actually used to wear this hat back in the days when they were pretty good. I, I, I have a helmet, like from when I was younger, of the width of the new home hat now. Well, I see the new ones. The one they wore a long time ago when I first started following them, and they went away from them. The one with the white in front of the cap. I actually don't like that hat, so I don't own a cap, and I don't want to really wear it. So um, I'm not going to be sporting that look anytime soon. I do like the road caps they wear now, but this is a little bit of my throwback to the one year that I covered 17 Orioles games. And, you know, I realized, Clint, I think I've told you this before, I couldn't handle I covered a game one night when Mike Messina took a perfect game into the ninth inning against the Indians. It was too tough for me. So I realized at that time I was never going to cover baseball again, Major League Baseball again, because I could not cut the cord to my rooting interest. So that's why I've done college sports and everything else ever since. This is the only time I get to act like a fan because I don't cover baseball, but yeah. – I'm a, I'm a big Nationals fan, and I usually go to about four or five games a year if I can get up there to D.C. Yeah, well, I have not been to that ballpark yet. I did go to one of their games at RFK, which was nostalgic for me because I grew up in the area, but I have not been to the Nationals Park. Camden Yards, about 350 times maybe, 300 times. I love that place. The reason we're doing this podcast is basketball record, uh, recruiting. In particular, Kerwin Walton, he's going to announce on April 25th you have been on his recruitment since it really started to uh, um, land squarely on the radar back last fall. We thought that there was some, you know, some, some um, stuff going on that maybe he might commit before the early signing period, but he did not. They got the Puff Johnson commitment. And here we are five months later, Clint, and Colonel Walton still hasn't committed, and he's still – on UNC's radar, UNC is still on his radar. So what is the latest right now inside of two weeks prior to when he will finally make an announcement? Well, you know, he's, he's always been very friendly to me when I reach out to him, which is generally a good sign when you cover basketball recruits for UNC and the, and the guys are interactive with you. I've had a few other websites reach out to me this week to get engaged intel and he's evidently not talking to some of these guys. So I always think sometimes that shows a little bit. Um, I know Eric Bossy and Corey Evans recently picked North Carolina on their, uh, their, their selection. And, you know, just do I have it cemented that he's going to pick Carolina? I don't, which is why I sometimes tend not to use a certain word on the message board that you know that people – uh, like to hear. Um, I'm pretty close to using that, but I don't have it firm that it's a done deal. But I think all the signs point to UNC. Um, you know, he's waited a long time to make this commitment. He did text me um, and tell me that he was definitely going to do it in April, which I put on our premium message board, I think a week or two ago. And now he's finally confirmed April 25th. Uh, his final list of schools, from my understanding, are Creighton, which is sort of a dark horse, uh, Arizona, Georgetown, Vanderbilt, Arizona, Minnesota, and of course the Tar Heels. He has not eliminated any of those schools, but I know several of the schools uh, from reaching out to their insiders, they, they don't feel like that they have a strong chance and they've moved in other directions. So um, we're moving forward as if we expect him to pick Carolina. Okay, 6'5", shooting guard. Um, before I ask you to kind of talk about his game, what are some of the other indicators that maybe lead you to believe that if it was going to be somebody else, maybe he would have popped a long time ago for somebody else. Was this an issue perhaps of him 
want, waiting to see what happens at UNC. You, we were talking about on the board back in uh, October, November, that, that a sixth spot would open up. We couldn't say Brandon Huffman's name at the time, but we were pretty strongly um, hinted that it would be Brandon Huffman. And now that that's opened up, and it's just a matter of time whenever Cole Anthony decides to announce that he's leaving, that that spot is there. Why is it taking it this long? And is that part of the indicator to you that it has taken this long that Carolina is the favorite here? Yeah, it's definitely one of the indicators because he could have picked several of these other schools months and months ago. So why was he holding out? You know, he tends to answer the easy questions when I ask him and he's a you know a little creative to get around some of the more direct questions. But, you know, he, he he's waited this long for a reason. And whenever I've talked to him, when we've done interviews on the site about Carolina, he talks about a chance to win a national title. And that comes out pretty early. So it shows to me that he has a very strong emotional attachment to that. And, you know, with that class that they're bringing in, you know, Caleb Love, RJ Davis, Walker Kessler, Daron Sharp, Puff Johnson, in addition to having Bacot, Brooks, and, and Leakey return, they've got the pieces to make a run. And I think – Kerwin Walton is going to be a piece of that puzzle. You know, is he a top 30 guy? No, he's not. I think he's rated 87th by rivals. He's a four-star prospect, but he's a piece of that puzzle. When you have a playmaker like a Caleb Love and you have a, a, a big man, Daron Sharp, who's going to command double teams down low, and you've got Walker Kessler who can step out to the three-point line and pop shots, you have to have that guy who can catch and release on the wing with size and you got Puff Johnson on one side. If you, you know, were to bring, uh, you know, uh, Kerwin off the bench or, or even in a starting role and have him on the other side, it prevents the defense from cheating. And I think when you have <coughs> – pardon me. I promise that's not coronavirus. Uh, when you do have, uh, you know, that, that piece like an R.J. Davis or a Caleb who can break down that defense, they get in that lane, they collapse it, they whip the ball out to a guy like a Puff Johnson or a Kerwin Walton. They're going to make them pay. And Kerwin Walton has the range and the quick release to make them pay. One of the things that has struck me about Kerwin Walton when I've read interviews with him, I've seen a couple on video. I think Kristen Peak had one at one point, is the reverence he has for Roy and for UNC. I think that when he looks at that jersey, the jersey means something to him. A lot of kids just look at it as a uniform. I think for, him, for me as a college basketball junkie, when I've – covered all these different schools. I've seen all the, the, the Blue Bloods play in person many, many times. And I, I love to look at the jersey for a moment, take that middle snapshot. In fact, in Las Vegas, right before the tip-off of, of Carolina and UCLA, I took a photo and I tweeted out that this is a great laundry game. Because I recognize, okay, this isn't classic UCLA, this isn't classic Carolina, but man, those uniforms look good and they're still those uniforms, they represent so much. I get the impression that Crow and Walton for as much as a 17 or 18 year old can sees that when he sees the UNC uniform. I mean, I'd absolutely agree with everything you said. The, 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 the feeling that I get when talking to him is that Carolina is hollowed and, and Carolina has that rich tradition and he's drawn to that. And I think Roy Williams built a really strong relationship with him. Some of the quotes you can see that he's kindly given us for Tar Heel Illustrated show that he's made him comfortable. He's had a strong relationship with him and, He's answered all of, the, all of his objections. And, again, I keep pointing back to why would this kid keep waiting if he had all these options? You know, now we're into – he's making this decision in late April. That's almost May. It's two months before generally these kids go to school. So, you know, I, I think there's a reason he, he held out. And, you know, can I guarantee it'll be Carolina? No, I can't, but I feel pretty good about – saying that he's probably going to pick Carolina. Okay, for the Carolina fans who are watching or listening right now, if they land Kerwin Walton, 6'5 shooting guard, what kind of player would Roy Williams be getting? They're getting a guy who can shoot the ball. You know, he's got great size, 6'5", long arms, quick release, good body. He's not a guy that's going to come in at 170 pounds and really get beat up and pushed off the block. He's, he's 200, probably 205 pounds, well put together. Um, Quick catch release. When you watch his videos, you're watching him in person. It's amazing how quickly and how confidently he gets the ball out of his hands. He can move around. He's fluid. He's not a super athlete. Um, you know, he's not a guy that's going to break a lot of people down off the dribble and, and, and dunk on heads. You know, that's that's not him. That's more Caleb Love. 
Um, but, you know, he's just going to be a guy that's a perfect piece but besides that beside that playmaker point guard and that, that, that four-man Walker Kessler who can step out and a dominant low post big man like De'Ron Sharp who can hold people to the post. He's going to really help spread the floor. And when you have all those pieces and you have the guy who can sit out on the wing out here and catch and release, you don't have a way to beat a team like Carolina. They gel and they play all together. They've got all the pieces to go deep into March and maybe April. What about the other side of the floor? If you have a true freshman at point guard and you've got another true freshman at the wing, you know, defense, all good defenses begin at the top. How, what kind of defender is he, and how do you see he and Caleb Love complementing one another defensively, given that there would be times when they're both on the floor together? Well, I think Caleb is actually a plus defender. You know, when I watched him at USA, I, I sometimes I, I zone into games and I just pick two kids that I want to really focus on, and I I watch them. There's times that I can step away from a game, and somebody goes, "Hey, how did you like the kid from you know New Jersey?" And I'm like, "Wait a minute, what kid from New Jersey?" Because I'm so <laughs> focused on watching the two guys that I was there to watch because I want to see everything that they do. Caleb Love is a really good defender because he exerts energy on that side of the ball. And you know, we've talked about this a lot. Kids don't like to defend anymore. They just want to outscore. They yeah. want to score. They want to run. They want to get points on the board. They, they, they play Matador defense. Caleb Love doesn't do that. So that prevents Kerwin Walton, if he's defending on the wing, from having to step in and help. I'm not saying Caleb Love won't ever get beat off the dribble. He will. But he can stay committed to his man, get around screens. He's got the long arms, so he'll be able to close out. I would say Kerwin Walton, from my estimation, he's an average defender. You know, he could probably be a little bit better defender, but I, I think the fact that Caleb Love is a plus defender will help him be a better defender. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No doubt about it. Okay, so you got five guys, and you've already alluded to all five guys. It's the number three class in the country. Four of them are McDonald's All-Americans. If you add a Kerwin Walton as the sixth guy, and he would be the lowest rated of the six guys, what does that do for that class? Does it bump them up a little bit because some people actually care about that stuff? And on the bigger scheme, in the 20 plus years that you've been covering recruiting, how would it compare to some previous UNC classes that Roy has brought in? Well, you know, as far as where they rank, I would think adding another top 100 guy may push him up a spot or two. Probably a better question for Eric Bossy because he's going to make that decision. But I mean, I don't see any way why, why they wouldn't uh, contend for the number one or number two spot. And I think that when you have the top rated recruiting, recruiting class, it's more of a marketing thing than anything because you can, you can sell that to the, you know, the, the future kids, you know, like, Hey, we brought on these six guys with ESPN or rivals or whatever, number one rated recruiting class in the country. It gives you headlines and it gives you uh, notoriety. Um, and then the second part of your question, I'm trying to remember what you just said. The, the other classes that Roy has brought in, I know that the Ellington, uh, Brandon Wright, Lawson class was monster because I think all three of them were number one at their positions. But how would it compare to the other big classes Roy's brought in at Carolina? I think as far as the names, they're right up there with those, those two classes. I think, I, I think we addressed this on either on a board or an article in the past where you had me working on, and I, yeah. I said it's in the top three. Obviously, we want to see how they do and how long they stay. You know, two guys that really jump off the page for me that could probably go pro pretty early would be Caleb Love and, and De'Ron Sharp. So a lot of the impact of recruiting classes, how long do they stay? How much did they improve? But as far as the star power with all the McDonald's All-Americans, this one is right up there at the top. And I think people are sleeping on Walker Kessler. And even though he's a five-star and he's a McDonald's guy, I think that he is he's going to be a, a major league good player for UNC as well. Even if they don't get Kerwin Walton, where it stands right now, juxtapose that class with what people just saw this year, which in part was the result of the cloud that hung over and Roy was not able to get a lot of the guys to visit that he got previously and obviously has gotten since because look at the class he's bringing in. Kind of juxtapose the fact that they're coming off that year because they couldn't get a lot of guys to come in, and now they're going to have a swarm of them coming in. They're going to be back to where they were almost overnight. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, as, as with any Roy Williams team, how quickly does the point guard get comfortable with that system and take command of the team yep. the way that Roy wants you to command that team? 
I don't know. I, I think on paper they have a tremendous amount of talent, and I think they should gel. And having the veterans like Leaky and, and Garrison and, and Armando, I guess, would be a veteran at this point too. They've got all the pieces. It's just about how they gel, how quickly the, the point guard runs the team the way he wants. Um, I'm real curious to see R.J. Davis and how what role he ends up filling, if that's a, a six-man off the bench or if he's playing the two alongside Caleb Love or if they're just interchanging and running two or three guys who can facilitate and handle at once. You know, that's up to him. Um, I think we'll see a lot of different lineups, but I just think that this has – this. This class and the way that these guys come together is, is really going to take Carolina to the level that we expect them to be. One of the things that struck me early last season, and I hit on it, I think, on the video we did after the UNCW or the Elon game, is that so many times Roy would turn to his bench because he, 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 he wanted to make a substitution. And he'd look along the bench, and he wouldn't make the substitution. He wouldn't pull anybody up. Next year, he's not going to have that issue. He's going to look to his bench, and the options are going to be there. To me, that alone will make this a better team because Roy will be able to get his message through in a way that maybe was a little more of a struggle this year because he, the bench is, is a great motivator, and he didn't really have that this year. And I think it's going to be really interesting next year, to, the first couple of games, to see him turn there and rip somebody up and get them in the game. And I think the team will kind of get it collectively a lot sooner than this team would have had they not had all the injuries because the injuries clearly destroyed them, but they had numerous other issues as well, one of which was no options. But next year's team, plenty of options. Plenty of options. You know, he's going to be able to do, do that thing. Like you notice, you know, that he looks to his bench and doesn't pull anybody up. He's – and I think a lot of what you speak to is accountability. When you're in a situation where, uh, was it iron sharpens iron, I think is one of, the, one of the things. If you've got another guy who can step right in, you think about a Puff Johnson and a Kerwin Walton. Both of them are, 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 are larger for the wing. They both can shoot the ball really well. They both have good range. They're both ancillary pieces, but they're not playmakers. So if you've got Puff Johnson in the game and maybe he, you know, just for – conversation took a couple of defensive plays off and Roy does that thing where he looks down and he pulls the Kerwin Walton off, off the bench. That's setting the, you know, that's setting the tone that, Hey, you're a great shooter, but you're going to have to contribute in other ways. And if you're not, I've got another guy I can go to. So it, it speaks to accountability, what you're saying. Also early in games, they had about four big time no shows after the new year hit, uh, you know, Georgia tech at home at Pitt, at Louisville and at Wake Forest. And I, I remember a game uh, about 10 or 12 years ago where the team wasn't ready to play and Roy made a wholesale substitution by like the, the five, six minute mark into the game. Couldn't do that with this club. There was just, no, there were no buttons to push at times. So that to me is going to be one, that alone will be one reason why this team is not just going to be better, but significantly better. Then you throw in the factor that these kids are going to be very talented. Then I think you throw in the factor that this team is going to have a much collectively clearer head and mindset. And they're going to have, uh, if someone goes down and misses a game or two, they're not going to lose a whole lot with whoever they put in. So that ship's going to hit a level and it's going to stay at that level and perhaps elevate like a lot of Roy's teams have in the past. Something that was simply not going to happen with last year's team. No, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, just the, just the way that team's going to be made up with all that depth is just going to be nothing but, you know, positivity coming out of, coming out of that bench and coming out of, out of the team and, and Roy Williams. And I got to think that a lot of these press conferences that you record and I watch, we're going to see a, a, lot, a lot more uh, contentness and pleasure in, in, in some of these post-game speeches that he gives. More humor, because when he's happy, he's funny. And he wasn't as funny this year as he, as he usually is. If you're watching us on YouTube, click subscribe, click like, get the notification bell so you get all of our videos that we upload. We cover Carolina football and basketball extensively and recruiting extensively. So lots of stuff there. If you're watching us on THI, stay with us on THI. we got a lot of stuff on the boards that you don't even see on the front page. He's Clint Jackson. I'm Andrew Jones. You've been watching Basketball Recruiting Podcast right here on TarHeelIllustrate.com. Screw the Nationals, even though I'm from the D.C. area. Go O's. Actually, I call them the Zero O's because they're brutal, but they're my brutal team, so I love them, Clint. One of these two teams 
just, I think, won the World Series. I don't remember which one, but maybe one of the... 1983 is only 37 years ago, my man. That's when Eddie Murray and Cal Ripken and Jim Palmer and Al Bumry and the boys and Rick Dempsey, the MVP, got it done. It was only 37 years ago. I remember it well. Yeah. Yeah, it was just like yesterday. Hey, the Nats might be the reigning World Series champs for a while. Could be for two years. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a shame. All right, man. Thanks, Clint. For Clint, I'm AJ. Thanks for stopping by.